Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, finishing off uh, this uh, lovely set of talks on this um, Open for Business event. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Julia Marcucci, who actually um, was here for our last Open for Business event after the Stochastics workshop. But she's gonna talk about something very different. And um, you're gonna be talking about uh, nonlinear optics and uh, topological control of extreme waves. Yeah. So please take it away. Thank you. So um, I hope you hear me well. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you again for the invitation. Uh, this place is starting being kind of familiar to me. And uh, I want also to stress the fact that this is a work that I have done uh, before uh, my current uh, employment. So this is an event that it's uh, also for people from business, I'm actually working uh, as startup in the product sector, but this work has been uh, developed in uh, Sapienza University of Rome and in the University of Ottawa uh, under the supervision of Professor Claudio Conti and the supervision of Professor uh, Robert Boyd. So uh, the title is quite long. I will keep it very uh, let's say calm and uh, relax since I am the last one, so <laughs> I have all the time. Uh, this was supposed to be a talk more related to the first part of this workshop. So it's a talk about optics and uh, uh, dispersive waves, dispersive nonlinear waves in uh, uh, nonlinear optics. The reason why uh, has been uh, planned right now is because. I asked for that. I kind of predicted I would have had a lot of disruption coming here from London. No, I'm joking. So uh, is this working? Maybe. Maha may I ask for your help? Ah, okay. Sometimes it gets stuck. Try it now. Okay. You see? Yes. Great. So, uh, rec function in nonlinear optics. Uh, what is a rec function? Uh, I guess that everybody knows, but let me just uh, reconsider what, what uh, we mean when we say rec function in nonlinear optics. We are talking of a, a continuous wave laser beam with an intensity distribution that is actually a rec function. Here, what you see is not truly a rec function, it's a, a super Gaussian. It's just a trick for a better simulation, having a function that is actually smooth. And then we consider the propagation of this uh, CW beam in a, a care medium. So a care medium is a uh, whatever medium that has a, a intensity dependent on linearity, which could be uh, focusing or uh, defocusing, depending on the care coefficient uh, uh, in front of our uh, nonlinear term. In this case, I will consider the self-focusing nonlinearity. So the uh, mathematical model, mathematical, uh, the, the form of the associated uh, Cauchy problem is this one, in which as a uh, partial differential equation, we see the nonlinear Schrodinger equation with uh, a um, nonlinear potential that, as you see, is intensity dependent. So it's dependent on the uh, square uh, Euclidean norm of the, uh, the field. And the initial condition is, again, the uh, description of a rec function. So uh, this work is deeply inspired by uh, the work of Gennady and uh, Kuhn workers uh, when they study the uh, dumb break problem for uh, focusing nonlinear shooting regression. And actually, this is a um, picture that is a screenshot uh, of uh, uh, his paper. So uh, no shame in admitting that. And uh, uh, in this paper, you can see that at the very beginning of your propagation, this is the waveform you can find in which we have shock-like uh, waves. Uh, I will stress the reason why I say shock-like. Uh, these two shock waves are uh, uh, counter propagating towards the middle of uh, uh, the beam following a self focusing nonlinearity, and so they can generate rock waves in the analytical form of uh, a peregrine solidon or uh, a cumulative breeder, depending on uh, uh, the case. And then the last, um, the long term propagation gives rise to a solidon gas. 
So these are all uh, waveforms that are very known in optics, as you can see in uh, uh, these uh, pictures taken from the rated uh, references. And the first uh, experimental observation related to this uh, rec function uh, was ready to, again, the shock-like waves. I say shock-like because um, in nonlinear optics, when we talk about shock waves, we are referring to the uh, uh, wave breaking that happens in general in a self-defocusing medium, in which we see, by the way, the generation of wanderer bores that are still uh, this very rapid oscillation where the intensity is mostly uh, focus uh, distributed on the uh, external part of the beam, exactly like you can see here. Well, instead here in this observation, the main uh, contribution that is creating this uh, rapid oscillation, this on your bores, is the diffraction uh, that, of course, in this case, when we consider just one part of the like, function, so actually we consider a step function, okay? And we can see that the diffraction is able to generate these uh, ondular bores. Then uh, the other uh, experimental uh, proof of this uh, theoretical analysis uh, has been, uh, so the first paper was uh, uh, done by um, Jason Flash uh, group. Uh, this paper instead uh, is by uh, Christophe Finot group, and they show the generation of uh, uh, peregrine soliton in, uh, um, in the case, again, uh, uh, in which these two shock waves um, superimpose to, to get this waveform. So uh, the first part of the talk that I am going to present here today is related to uh, uh, extra contribution to this experimental observation to this model in which we actually introduce a topological description uh, of these waves uh, in uh, photorefractive crystals. So in crystal in which this care nonlinearity has uh, a, peculiar, uh, a peculiarity that is time dependent. And I will show you in this framework, the generation of acmedial breeders and the generation of peregrine soidon. The second part of this talk is actually the quantum counterpart of, uh, this, uh, of the peregrine soidon generation. So I will introduce you briefly to the concept of quantum uh, nonlinear waves. And, uh, and then I will show you our approach to uh, simulate the solution of a quantum nonlinear Schrodinger equation and then the effect of quantum noise on, this, uh, uh, on the generation of these peregrine solitons. So let me start with the topological control of nonlinear waves. Uh, this is the uh, phase diagram uh, that is uh, the base, uh, at the basis of our uh, geometric uh, description of um, this nonlinear Schrodinger uh, solution. This is our, uh, our paper. And this is a paper that I am, is just the featuring of uh, this paper here, but it's the only paper in which I have uh, the grid wave by Okusaki. Uh, Okusaki, yeah. Uh, in um, uh, ready to my name, so I'm super proud of it. <laughs> Jogging. Uh, so, Geometrical description. Um, we consider, as Gennady did, the finite gap theory, which is the counterpart of the inverse scattering transform for periodic problems. So when we solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in this case, what we get is that the solutions are uh, written as a ratio of uh, Riemann theta functions uh, with the same uh, genus, uh, this uh, G here. So it means that every solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation can be associated to a hyperallelic Riemann surface uh, with this genus G. So essentially it means that we are introducing a isomorphism between wave classes and genera. So when we consider the shock waves, they have genus equal one, so they can be associated uh, to a torus. So when we consider instead the whole class of the 
uh, first order of uh, peregrine solidons, these have uh, genus equal to, and they can be associated to a double torus, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Sorry. So this means essentially that we are using a um, topological invariant, that is the genus, to characterize complex wave regimes. So um, to label the class of uh, shock waves, the class of first order peregrine solidons, the class of second order peregrine solidons, the class of uh, um, solidon gases, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so if we control the genus, in principle, we are controlling the out, at least the classes, the class of the output of our experiment. The question is, if this is possible, in our paper, we show that it is. So we did uh, simulations and experiments in uh, photorefractive crystals. Uh, photorefractive crystals are uh, a particular nonlinear media in which the uh, nonlinearity is of the crystal is excited with an external uh, pump laser that is able to create a voltage inside the crystal because the charges are redistributing in, uh, in a way that they accumulate on the faces of the crystal. So in this way, what we can see is that in the first part of this uh, cumulative process, the uh, model of the light inside of this crystal is still ruled by the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but now the care coefficient, this rho of T here, is actually a function of time that is following this exponential um, behavior. So if we are far away from the saturation regime, what we can see is that actually we have uh, a increasing nonlinearity. So as the nonlinearity changes, of course, also the genus changes. This means that in principle, we can do simulations uh, using this model and consider in which phase we are for our output. So we will have a map in time and where in time we know that our nonlinearity is increasing in which we pass from a shock phase to a breather phase to a solid on gas phase. And properly designing the detection time, we can design also the class of the wave that we are going to detect. So this is why we plotted this in this fancy um, phase diagram, because essentially here we can see on the x-axis that we have the beam waste, so the width of our uh, uh, laser beam of our uh, rec function. And here we have the dispersion, which is roughly speaking the uh, inverse of the nonlinearity. And uh, what we can see is that if we fix the beam waste, so if we fix the width of our laser beam, we are moving vertically on this diagram. And this expresses indeed the fact that we are moving from a dispersive shockwave phase to a rock wave phase to a solid on gas phase. These are uh, the uh, simulations and the experimental observation we made. We use these setup, in which you can see that we have a green CW laser that uh, passes through a, a cylindrical lens because we need to move from a two plus one model to a one plus one model. And this optically speaking is done using a cylindrical lens. Then we use a mask to um, get the uh, rec function. So the intensity distribution that is actually rectangular. Then uh, the laser beam passes through the photorefractive crystal that is pumped using a laser on a different wavelength to avoid any interference contribution. And everything is detected by the CCD camera here. So the simulation show uh, the simulations show the um, behavior of the dispersion and the evolution of the rect function. Uh, and again, it passes through all the phases that we expected. 
These are instead the experimental observation where we can see actually the same. So the agreement is quite remarkable. And also in this panel, we can see the transverse profile uh, uh, along the breather phase where the blue dots are the experimental results, the results and instead the um, solid purple line is the fitting with the uh, uh, Achmedia breather. So, Sorry, how do you control the non-linearity in your experiment with time? I control the non with time and with the pump laser. Just what you do with the pump laser, lower the power of the pump laser. The pump laser is the one that excites the non-linearity. So there is a clear uh, contribution of the intensity of the pump laser here inside right. the, the, the Yes, the intensity of the pump laser. And then everything is, let's say, compute a priori. So we compute the time a priori and we say, okay, this time I must have a rock wave. That's the main idea. Okay. So uh, we are moving along this phase diagram um, on, on this line, vertical line here. So we are passed because this has been done considering a rec function uh, with a beam waste that was 140 migrants. And this means that we are passing through this dispersive shockwave phase, rock wave, and uh, solid on glass. Uh, this is what happens instead when we consider a small waste. So here we consider experimentally, uh, and also in the simulations, a uh, uh, beam waste of 30 microns. You can see, I mean, what we expect from the simulation, we got uh, directly into the uh, rock wave phase because the nonlinearity, uh, so the beam is already focused uh, from the beginning, so we cannot truly see the dispersive phase, so the generation of shock waves. And uh, this is what happens instead in uh, the, the experiments. These three panels are the transverse profile that you can get along these dashed lines. So you have the, the first generation of a peregrine soil. Again, here the solid line, solid purple line is the fitting and instead the dot line uh, is the experimental observation. Then you have the annihilation that the generation of the second order uh, peregrine solid on. So now we are moving here. That's why we cannot appreciate the uh, dispersive shockwave phase. So, this is all that I wanted to tell you about this topological control extreme wave. Now I'm going to talk uh, uh, about the second part of this, uh, of this work in which we move quantum. Uh, so this is the uh, proceeding to the Advanced Photonics uh, Congress uh, that we uh, presented about this work uh, done uh, in the University of Ottawa, still collaborating with Sabienza. Uh, and this is what you see classically, so essentially it's a different heat map of the same uh, propagation I showed you before. Now the nonlinearity is no more time dependent. Is the, the, the nonlinearity is just the normal kernel linearity, okay? So there is no more time dependence. Here instead is what you see when you consider a, a low photon number. So when you consider a low photon, photon number, what you expect is that the um, phase fluctuations of uh, photons, which now don't have any more uh, uh, phase relation that is solid, actually the phase relation is broken, um, give also a sort of statistical contribution to the generation of rock waves, which enhances, I will show you, the uh, peak per number of photons of the uh, rock wave itself. So, for so, what should be interesting in studying quantum uh, nonlinear waves because they are uh, being observed. So, as you can see from this paper of uh, 2018, uh, they were able to observe a quantum solid on following the definition given by Drummond uh, with just three photons. Okay. And also because these new states can be uh, very interesting for many different applications. Uh, last but not least, to the generation of highly entangled multimode states that are very uh, useful for uh, quantum computing, uh, which you know it's something I'm very interested in. So there are different approaches to uh, study these quantum nonlinear waves. One of these that recalls 
uh, a little bit more uh, the uh, normal theory of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is to consider the quantum inverse uh, scattering transform, uh, which was developed by Corbin. Uh, but this is not actually what we did. Uh, we used, uh, uh, we merged two different methods. Uh, so we use the definition of quantum solidons and uh, um, in general, uh, quantum nonlinear waves or lighthouse. And then, which is based on uh, the better ansacks. Uh, uh, so we have a definition of a, quantum eigenfunctions that relies on a superposition of plane waves. And then the superposition of plane waves for the quantum solidon is done in a specific way that I will show you. Uh, and this is the work of Lighthouse. And then to study the evolution, we use phase space methods, in particular the positive peer representation developed by uh, Gardiner and Drummond. So I will go now into the details of this uh, treaties. So to define a quantum solidon, we use this mathematical uh, definition. So a quantum solidon is a uh, quantum eigenstate uh, of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is a superposition of coherent states. Uh, unfortunately, now explaining all the jargon of the quantum optics can be a little bit difficult, but essentially consider this as before we had functions and now we have operators somehow, okay. Uh, so these coherent states are the uh, states that are the most similar one to the uh, classical states. Uh, and they are uh, distributed following a, a Gaussian distribution of the momenta. So to come back to the classical description, we must have an agreement between what we are defining at a quantum level and the mean value computed on the uh, electrical quantum field uh, of our system. So essentially when we compute the mean value at high photon number, we must get back the classical theory. And this is exactly what happens because at high photon number, this delta P goes to, uh, goes to zero and we get the hyperbolic second that we expect to have when we consider classical solidons. So these are the simulation of these solidons. The first one is at high photon number. And you can see that you get a true soliton. The second one instead is the one uh, at 200 photons, so essentially at low photon number. Uh, still, everything here is following a semi-classical uh, regime. So I can't really go to the regime of three photon number. This is an initial treatise to this problem. But what we can see here is that the quantum noise that has a contribution proportional to one over the square root of the number of photons can cause this phase fluctuation, which uh, make the soliton no more propagation invariant. So how do we do this? We, first of all, go quantum, starting from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, it's Hamiltonian, and then, we kind of, let's say, substitute to every classical field a uh, quantum uh, field operator. Uh, so now the classical wave function that we expect to have uh, is actually the mean value computed on our quantum uh, state that I call here extreme because here we are considering also uh, rock waves, which at high photon number should give us again the classical uh, function. To solve the evolution problem, we consider a positive peer representation that is a map uh, between a nonlinear field theory to a system of stochastic differential equation. The phase space method we use is the positive peer representation developed by Gardner and Drama in uh, 1980 from the peer representation developed by Glauer and Sudarshan uh, in uh, 1963, which had unfortunately the um, property to not be um, positive definite as a, a probability distribution uh, should be, so that's why they move to the positive P representation. So this positive P representation acts in this way. We consider the density matrix rho 
And we expand this density matrix in two sets of coherent states, which again are the quantum states that are the closest one to the uh, classical state. <coughs> Sorry. And then uh, um, this expansion is done on uh, quantum projectors weighted by this probability distribution that will be for us essentially the uh, probability distribution which we are going to study the evolution. From this, we can see that we can transform the quantum linear Schrodinger equation into a system of two couple uh, partial differential stochastic equation where the stochastic term uh, is given by these two independent white noses, uh, xi and eta. So here, you can even switch off your brain if you want, but uh, I, it's anyway uh, workshop in a mathematics department. So I want to give you more details. Um, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, how we actually solve this quantum nonlinear Schrodinger equation, we consider it's Hamiltonian, and we consider the corresponding von Neumann equation for uh, the uh, density matrix. Uh, here, the T uh, appendix here is the derivative, the temporal derivative. Then we write, we express this density matrix in terms of the positive period representation. We get as more or less for the heat equation, a Fokker-Planck equation for the probability distribution. Then we move uh, to a either representation for uh, stochastic processes, and we get the system of two couple uh, stochastic linear Schrodinger equations that I showed you before. We find the solution of uh, these equations, and we have then uh, the solution of the quantum linear Schrodinger equation. Now, the initial condition of the solution for us being in the uh, semi classical approximation, essentially, it's like if the uh, P function uh, is actually a uh, Dirac delta function or something that is just a little broader than the Dirac delta function. If we want to move truly quantum, this should be uh, at least a Gaussian distribution. So essentially, and that's the reason why we are still working on this matter and we couldn't get any good publication out of it. Uh, it's because you should actually have a statistical distribution of your initial condition that makes your code very computationally demanding. So these are the simulations we did in the semi-classic approximation. Uh, here, uh, indeed, uh, this is what I explained to you before. Uh, it's the, what happens at a classical regime. Here is what happens at a quantum regime, so at a low photon number regime. Uh, the, way we uh, define the initial condition, we still have a like function uh, is done in a way that when we consider the um, quantum uh, eigenfunction, uh, the area uh, of this quantum eigenfunction is actually the number of photons. Uh, and you can see indeed again that the quantum noise causes phase fluctuations. So how is this affecting the intensity peak per number of photons? Is, intent, is affecting the, the intensity peak per number of photons in a way that um, is giving an extra contribution. So what we can see is that the rock wave efficiency at low photon number is actually higher. So this is the peregrine solid on mean intensity per photon number, and this is the uh, photon number. So you can see that when I am at low photon number, this efficiency is much higher. And then also this standard deviation follows this uh, behavior, not in, a, in such a strong way that we can say that everything is wrong. I mean, at low photon number, we have just four times the error that we have uh, at, uh, at the classical regime. So it's very promising. These are the two plots. You can even um, don't consider, do not consider this because they represent the mean time of the first occurrence of the rock wave, uh, which is actually giving no information. Um, so I conclude. Uh, we demonstrated that the topological, that topological invariants can describe complex right regimes, and we show theoretically and experimentally uh, this transition between shock, rock, and solid on gas phase 
And uh, we saw how we can supervise uh, considering this topological control in which we design a priori the uh, time of the detection uh, from our uh, refractive crystal. Then I showed you the quantum counterpart for uh, uh, time independent uh, kernel linearity uh, in which um, I show you our approach to do simulation of the uh, solution of the quantum linear Schrodinger equation. And I reported our results on uh, quantum noise effects on the rock wave generation efficiency showing that essentially it increases the uh, efficiency of rock wave generation at low order number. Thank you for your attention. Julia, uh, do we have any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. It's a, a, um, it's a question for the second part of your talk. Um, I'm not at all an expert, but I want uh, people in, in BC physics, they, they use a method that seems similar, they call truncated Wigner. Uh, yeah. What what are the that was my first question yeah. and I have another so, one. So essentially, instead of having, oh, I can take it here. Instead of having uh, the positive P representation, you have a different phase space method. Okay. Uh, okay, in which you're using a different probability distribution to uh, describe your quantum state. But it's a matter of choice. There should not be much difference between. There them. are some uh, limitation. Uh, I'm not an expert of the Wigner function, so I don't want to say something that is wrong. Uh, but one of these is that, again, it's not positive uh, definite. Uh, and so you can have uh, negative values. And actually, the negative values of the Wigner function are uh, is a sort of signature of the quantum nature. So it is a different approach. Okay. Instead, you have a kind of OCME uh, like uh, distribution, which is always positive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's the reason why, um, when you consider a positive peer representation, you see you are actually overfitting your system because you are considering two uh, bases to describe your your system. And these two bases are not truly independent between each other. But this is the way to to get the positive definite uh, probability distribution. Okay, and if I may have a second question. Um, uh, you said that when the number of photon is large, you're going to the classical regime, but you have a, do you have a combination of parameters that involve H bar, that involves the density yeah. that measure this? So, uh... Essentially, what you have is that the C that you have here, um, this part here, this C, this is already normalized. So everything that you can see here follows a, re a renormalization uh, per number of photons. So also this factor here as at the denominator, the number of photons. That's the reason why in uh, several parts of my talk, I said uh, that the quantum noise is proportional to one over the square root of the number of photons. It's because you can consider the C as a C naught over the number of photons. If you do that, you can see that your stochastic terms depend on the number of photons in, uh, in a way that when the number of photons is high, the stochastic term is giving you no contribution at all. And this so you is come a back. function of uh, N2 and, uh, and the intensity. And it's uh, a function of the intensity. The number of photons is proportional to the intensity of and your- And also, uh, I guess, to the, but I don't want to. Of the mic too long. The, the nonlinear parameter also comes into play. Yes, this is a kind. Uh, this is a kind of analysis that uh, we are doing right now. So we are considering um, media like, for example, epsilon near zero materials in which the uh, N two is actually very very high. Okay, and we want to see how these quantum states interact in uh, this kind of materials. 
uh, here the C is indeed dependent. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the mathematical expression, so I have to remember what I wrote here, but there is again a, a renormalization here in a way that the C has at the denominator the N2 and at the denominator the number of photons, or probably both of them at the denominator, I would say. Yes, I would say both of them at the denominator. Yes, of course. So uh, that's the reason why uh, when you consider a very strong nonlinearity and a very uh, high number of photons, uh, you don't see any quantum effect. Any other questions? I, I have one question. So in the first part of your talk, sure. so in, in fibers, we saw um, Stefano Trio last week talk about uh, propagation along fibers and the way that they model the spatiotemporal structure is by getting the output and then uh, recording that and then changing the power, input power, and then getting a different output. Uh, and then recording that. And then they can consider this as um, kind of modeling the propagation along the fiber. Right? Yes, they're only getting yes, the output. Yes. So that they can't image inside the fiber, or, that, or maybe it's very difficult to do. So, so it, it can, can I interpret what you're doing as a similar feature for spatial optics, right? Because you're doing a diffraction in a crystal and um, you, you have no time dynamics unless you turn your knob. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We can say Is that so. Right? Yes, even if uh, probably here I have more uh, spatial temporal coupling than Stefano has in uh, his problems. But yeah, definitely. Okay. We fix the the 